This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Gnosis, an open platform for businesses to create their own prediction market applications on top of the Ethereum network. They recently launched Gnosis X, a challenge inviting developers to build apps on top of the Gnosis platform. To learn more, go to epicenter.tv slash Gnosis X. Hello and welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects and startups driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Brian Fabian Crane. And I'm Meher Roy. Today, we are about to chat with Carl Flursch, who is a research scientist at the Ethereum Foundation. And Carl really explains topics really well. So we sort of having him on board, explain to us what the Plasma project is all about. Carl, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Happy to be here. So before we start, tell us a bit about your background and how you got to be involved in the blockchain space. So I have been interested in peer-to-peer -peer technology for quite some time. I was doing stuff with like WebTorrent, I was into BitTorrent, but I wasn't so into Bitcoin because of all the kind of money talk. Money wasn't really my thing. But then when Ethereum came around and it was this kind of global decentralized kind of computer science-y uh, uh, problem, I was like, oh, this is the missing piece. I see why this this like economic stuff is actually really important. And so that kind of led me to, to work at Consensus. I was working um, there for uh, about a year and a half. And on the tail end of working at Consensus, I met with Vlad and, and wanted to help out with some Casper stuff. And then I uh, uh, worked with him on that. And then I worked with Vitalik on even more Casper stuff and eventually just went full uh, Ethereum Foundation researcher and and uh, uh, now spend all my time on uh, Casper sharding and Plasma. Cool. Um, so there's these three projects, right? There's like Casper, there's sharding, and there's Plasma. We'll cover Plasma in depth during this episode, but could you give us a sense of what these three projects are and how they connect? Sure. So I guess I will start with Casper. Casper is a proof of stake protocol, which has been in the works at the Ethereum Foundation for multiple years. Um, and essentially what it does is it forms consensus on the root Ethereum chain. And what that means is it basically provides this guarantee around uh, uh, transaction or block ordering. And it says, okay, well, this is the one history and reverting this one history is very costly. And so the, the kind of design space around this is, okay, let's make it so that we have the most quote unquote secure blockchain, AKA this blockchain that resists censorship the best. And it also, uh, you know, the history will not change under your feet. And uh, these are the kinds of, you know, concerns around Casper. So that is like the security side of things. Then sharding is where we take the, the kind of Casper protocol and we make it so that it secures not just one like small bit of, of data, we make it secure a huge amount of information. So we basically pump up the, the, the throughput of this blockchain, uh, uh, you know, drastically. And so we want to, instead of, um, you know, doing 10, 15 transactions per second, we want 150 or 1,500 and, 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 you know, continue from there. Um, and then Finally, we have Plasma, and Plasma is essentially a design pattern, a, a space of, of designs which allow you to kind of create your own scalable blockchain uh, and run it, you know, maintain it yourself, however you get the security benefits of the main Ethereum chain. So that means that, you know, the current proof of work security, which is pretty good, and then eventually the pr uh, proof of stake Casper security, which will be even better. Um, and so you get the, the security of the main chain while being able to deploy your own. And so these are the kinds of three frontiers uh, for, for Ethereum research these days and what I'm working on. And so with, with these, it, it seems like Plasma is quite, or Plasma Cash, right? What we're going to talk about seems to be pretty close, right? And like in a you know, reasonably time horizon. Casper, uh, it's always hard to tell. I mean, I think we have had Vitalik on here, I don't know, two and a half years ago or something, and it was like six months away or something like that. So, and, and of course now it's Casper is in two stages, right? There's the fast finality gadget and then full Casper. Is that still the plan? Yes. So I can, I can quickly do a little 
timeline stuff is impossible, so I'm not giving any guarantees. However, I can say the facts, and the facts are that we have a, a very reasonable plasma spec. So that's, of course, you know, that's coming very soon, and anyone can implement it. It's really, there are basically no barriers um, regarding plasma and implementing plasma. That's super simple. Um, regarding Casper, uh, last January, I my first thing that I was really focused on is implementing the Casper FFG testnet, like a full implementation of Casper FFG. Um, and that was released on January 1st. And since then, there is now a security audit that is underway of the Casper contract. You can read it, read it um, online, there, you know, formal verification and stuff. Like, this is a really amazing security audit team. Um, and there's also, uh, you know, implementations that are being done for, for multiple clients. Currently, I think the, there's, you know, there's Pyetherium and then there's the Java um, implementation. So while, you know, maybe maybe last time you talked about Casper, it was like, quote unquote, six months away. This is like we are we are refining so that it can be deployed on the main net. And there is something that works like you can download it and read the full spec. Um, and I think people should be a little bit uh, more excited about the hybrid friendly finality Casper than than they maybe are currently, um, because it turns out that you get a huge number of the benefits of uh, Casper when you just add in this friendly finality gadget. Um, and that that is, you, you get this kind of economic finality after 20 minutes. And while that may seem like quite a long time, you can actually have guarantees even sooner than 20 minutes using other mechanisms. So like Casper, the friendly finality gadget, is the kind of uh, uh, big you know step forward that that we've been waiting for in in some ways um and so then we'll we'll get full casper eventually but but this is like oh this is so exciting friendly finality and, and so what are the main things that this finality is so crucial for so one one thing i have you know spoken with some people about that makes sense to me why finality is important there is is having fast finality right because let's say you build some kind of user application and then something reverts and you have to roll back state like that obviously from a user experience perspective sounds like a nightmare but then 20 minutes isn't really going to do that for you so what does the 20 minute thing do for you so i would think of finality maybe in terms of like okay what is the economic penalty for reverting a particular transaction and so what we want to do is we want to make the the economic penalty as high as possible and so in terms of uh, the kind of like 20 minute finality, you have this really, really high penalty for reverting any, uh, any previous history. And that is like the, the kind of, you know, two chains get finalized, at least one third of all validators stick gets slashed. So to, to, to revert history at all, um, or, or at least create a kind of conflict in the history, you need to spend, you know, one third of the total validators stake. Um, and that gets burned. Um, so this is, this is kind of like the, the really secure stuff. Um, and what, what, what Casper allows us to do is because we have, we're using kind of these coins to secure the, the, the chain, we can now like reduce the block rewards for proof of work miners because now they're limited in how much they can revert. They can only revert, you know, 20 minutes back. And so if you do wait for that finality, now you're able to say, okay, I know without a doubt that this block is included in the main chain. So that's kind of like your, you know, global finality. And that's slower to come about and, uh, you know, has really strong security guarantees. I, I just wanted to ask one question on this point here. So you said, okay, because you have this 20 minute finality thing, you can reduce the, the block rewards for miners or proof of work miners. Do you mind explaining the connection there? Like, why does that allow you to reduce block rewards? Yes. So, so essentially, the the thing that you, we pay miners to do is to essentially like secure a single chain that would you know a single view of history that doesn't get changed, doesn't get reverted, that you know uh, uh, has has a number of properties that we really like, right? And and we pay them quite a lot. I mean, and the actual amount that we pay them is kind of this arbitrary thing because, you know, macroeconomics are, is hard. But we definitely, we're paying them millions of dollars a day. And so that, that is, you know, an insane expense. Now, with proof of stake, what we do with this friendly finality gadget is we now limit the attack surface of these proof of work miners. We say, okay, you're able to revert, you know, 
blocks. However, you're not able to revert blocks past 20 minutes. So it, essentially, you wait a certain period of time. Now you know that this, you know, this block is finalized, will not be reverted. And no matter what, even if you had a, you know, proof of work, 51% attack, you know, 100% attack, you still would not be able to revert that transaction. And so that means that now, okay, the actual like impact that paying these miners less will have is greatly reduced. Even if we paid them nothing, you know, maybe, maybe it would work out. Who knows? We, these are <laughs> probably, probably good to pay the miners, but who knows? Maybe transactions are enough, and that's, that's, that's in the future. So, so basically the idea is before you had this like massive bounty in a way, right? If you successfully pull off an attack and now the bounty, and, and, and because of that, it made sense to pay them a lot because that means a lot of infrastructure and then also the cost is very high. But now with the fast finality gadget, you're shrinking this dramatically. And so the, the benefit of pulling off an attack is also shrunk dramatically. So it doesn't make any sense anymore to have this like massive, huge, expensive infrastructure to protest like this attack surface. So you can exactly massive. Shooting. Okay. Explain to us the third piece, like sharding. Sure. So sharding essentially right now, Ethereum can only process, you know, quote unquote, 15 transactions per second. But basically it doesn't do a lot of computation really quickly. Now, what we want to do is we want to say, okay, we have this one blockchain and it's actually able to uh, uh, process transactions like way more transactions and the way that we actually do this is is non-trivial the the thing is okay one way to shard or to scale a blockchain is to just like pump up the the transactions per second and that the, the that works to some extent right you can say okay let's just add you know quote quote unquote bigger blocks or or uh, you know more you know th throughput uh, that works to some extent However, eventually you get to a point where normal laptops are no longer able to actually process the entire blockchain. And so you, you now limit who can actually run this uh, uh, you know, consensus protocol. And because we want to keep it decentralized, we want to make sure that, okay, a laptop is able to validate the blockchain. So the better way to, to scale uh, and, and really hit, hit high, high scale is um, by sharding the blockchain. And that means that we take... We, we allow like different computers to validate different parts of the blockchain. So every computer is only validating a small slice of the full you know, transaction throughput. But because of essentially like, you know, probabilistic guarantees and uh, uh, you know, clever constructions that, that we're working on, um, the actual sum effect is that the entirety of that you know, large throughput is secured, is available. And, uh, you know, we can we can support many more transactions per second. So and you can download only the parts of the blockchain that you care about and you're validating only subsections of the full blockchain. But as a whole, it becomes this like really high throughput um, uh, consensus mechanism. So in, in terms of dependence, does sharding depend on the friendly finality gadget or can it be implemented independently of it? So it can be implemented independently of it. However, there is a kind of the, the full vision is that they, they all come together and the, the sharding and the Casper stuff is kind of merged into one. However, there are ways to Im implement it independently. And so like that's what we're, we're doing right now is we have parallel tracks for uh, Casper and sharding where Casper is being implemented kind of, you know, the test net that's going through these iterations. Um, to to eventually be released and then sharding we have like clients that are working on uh, sharding implementations in parallel so they're 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 building their own infrastructure and then eventually you know we can merge them together later um, so so basically for for development purposes and and for simplicity we we kind of like solve each problem independently and then combine them later for a the unified ethereum vision so the unified e ethereum vision now is sort of becoming that there's Casper or proof of stake, which is increasing the quality of security of the blockchain itself, right? Because one of the things it does, as I see it, it does two things. A, it allows the punishment of validators, whereas miners cannot be punished. So uh, it improves the security of the game, so to say. And then it also allows... Um, Ethereum to have finality, much better finality properties than what it currently has. So that's one piece. The second piece is uh, sharding, which is to use 
Casper and Proof of Stake to increase the transaction throughput through the Ethereum chain. And then the third piece is Plasma, which is to allow the Ethereum system to lend its security to some other blockchain that an entrepreneur created for their own purpose. So for example, the Gnosis people, they create their own chain, which is specialized for prediction markets. The main Ethereum chain could lend its security, which is very high because the market cap of Ether is very high. You could lend its security to the Gnosis chain and uh, therefore have a sort of a win-win situation uh, between the Ethereum community and all of these other coin communities that are springing up. And so all of these things would like kind of combine in order to make a highly secure and high throughput system that can presumably handle most of the uh, decentralized applications being built. That's right. Awesome. Cool. So let's let's now segue into Plasma, right? Um, now, I think Plasma as a concept came sometime last year when Vitalik and Joseph Poon released a paper. And since then, the, the vision has undergone some iteration. So could you get into the history of Plasma and how this idea came to be and how it has evolved? Sure. So yeah, uh, just as you said, Joseph Poon and Vitalik came up with this concept of, of Plasma and the, the ability to use a, a secure root chain to provide the like uh, guarantees around like exits from the less secure chain. So essentially guarantee uh, uh, assets of a less secure chain um, and through, through this ex exit mechanism. And so we, we worked on uh, that, the white paper was released and uh, um, people started getting interested and then we started holding these Plasma implementers calls um, and they're, they're all on YouTube. And we, we, you know, talked with the community. There are a lot of people who are excited about using this exit mechanism. A, a spec called uh, Plasma MVP was created, uh, which essentially is a kind of simple version of a, a uh, like, UTXO-based um, plasma chain with where, where you can scale up, you know, 1,000 transactions per second probably around, around there. Um, and then later on, relatively recently, uh, plasma cash was cr was was uh, created or or specked out, and that um, it took the original plasma idea and it simplified it in a lot of ways, um, and it and it basically provided a a very reasonable scaling solution for for plasma. So instead, in plasma MVP, it was you know uh, there were a couple problems. There was like a really bad mass exit vulnerability. Um, scalability was limited to you know about a thousand transactions per second, um, but then when Plasma Cash came around, now the mass exit vulnerability has it was you know significantly mitigated, and we we can now scale up uh, you know pretty high. Um, I there without a uh, I don't I don't see any uh, upper limit uh, that. <laughs> jumps out at me that I want to say <laughs> but but it's it's very scalable so w one thing that stood out to me um is of course Joseph Poon many you will be aware of was also the original author of the lightning network paper and, and you know we, we did an episode on epicenter with him and his co-author many years ago there are a lot of similarities, right, between Plasma and Lightning Network. It's just that connection is very obvious. But one of the big differences is that, that Lightning isn't actually a blockchain, right? So you, you don't have any more, like, it's a very different network topology. And, like, we'll see how it works out, but it's, it's very radically different. Whereas Plasma, you still have basically a blockchain that's just sort of inheriting the security. Do you have any idea why this shift and why didn't they try to build plasma also as as not a blockchain but something more akin to lightning network was that driven by the idea that okay lightning won't be able to do computation properly so actually a blockchain structure will make more sense for that I can't say that I know exactly the the thought process for how this transformation happened um, I can say that the kind of concept of state channels more generally, um, so, so both of these technologies are within the kind of bucket 
of state channels, right? You're you're you have some kind of off-chain messages that are affecting the you know outcome of an on-chain game, and so this is this is kind of the the overarching um, uh, you know design space, and then I I. I the 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 like lightning network approach made a lot of sense you're signing off chain messages and you're transacting and you don't actually have to go on to the to the uh you know root chain all the time and then plasma allowed for it it actually does simplify a lot of things so i don't know oftentimes what happens with with creating these designs is you start off with one idea and then you kind of work with it and it makes a lot of sense and then you you kind of you you reconceptualize things and you you actually end up with a much simpler design, and so that actually happened with uh, Casper FFG, and that also happened with uh, uh, sharding, and and we're 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 always like iterating to find the kind of like what is the most you know the simplest and most elegant uh, solution to this problem, and so I think you know. Joseph Poon, I can't speak for him, but I imagine that he was thinking about this. He's like, okay, now I have the ability to use smart contracts and I can, you know, build on, why don't I take, make use of this smart contract platform instead of just this, you know, payment platform, this, uh, you know, uh, with a simple scripting language in, in Bitcoin. And so he probably was like, okay, now here's our slightly changed design space. How can I make use of this as best as possible? And so, you know, Plasma comes around and, and it turns out Plasma is super insanely simple. Yeah, I think that's an interesting point because I agree with you that, you know, reading about Plasma and, you know, we'll get more into this, but it's actually it seems pretty, pretty straightforward and easy to understand. But Lightning Network, I don't personally feel I really understand what it will be like, what, you know, these different hubs and Lightning nodes and, and what will this network look like? Uh, you know, what are the risks associated with Like, there's so many questions that for me at least are unclear uh, so I, I agree with you it does seem much simpler so another question on this so you mentioned plasma MEP and the plasma MEP was UTXO based and is is that also true for plasma cash or, and, and why was that UTXO based if you know ethereum generally is is not so every plasma chain can have its own custom logic and so that allows you to kind of get certain properties that, you know, if you want to have certain things be really, really fast to compute, maybe you can have a plasma chain that is optimized for particular tasks. And so it doesn't actually matter what the mechanism by which your computing state transitions is, like in, you know, UTXOs or account-based or whatever it is, the, the plasma chain can, can use anything. And you just code in that, uh, that mechanism into an ethereum smart contract and now the ethereum smart contract can you know run that those state transitions and comp and immediate that chain so in other words those the this concerns are totally separate you don't have to use any consensus protocol that looks like ethereum's consensus protocol or any uh, evm that you know the ethereum enshrines um so so the plasma mvp and plasma cash they are uh, uh just I don't know if it's super useful to talk about the UTXO bit, um, but the way that they uh, kind of compute their, the way that they structure their Merkle tree, the way that they structure uh, their the chain is just slightly different. And in Plasma Cache, it really lends itself to parallelization and um, being able to only compute uh, or only keep track of coins that you care about. Um, I can go into the difference between Plasma and Plasma, Plasma MVP if you want. Um, Okay, sure. So, so essentially, Plasma MVP, you're keeping track of every single coin, and you're validating that every single coin on the network is, you know, uh, uh, um, like the state transitions are happening properly. And so you're 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 pulling all the coins or all the transactions, and you're saying, okay, I'm going to compl compute these locally, and if there's any problem, then I'm going to submit a transaction to the main chain and take my coins out. Now. The, the difference with Plasma Cash is that you now only have to care about the coins that you particularly hold. So when you send coins to a Plasma Cash smart contract, those coins will be given uh, specific IDs. And those IDs will correspond to branches in the Merkle tree, in the like whole Plasma uh, Cash Merkle tree. And so your, what your job is, is your job is, okay, every time there's a block that's created onto the root, on the root chain, you're going to validate the branches of the Merkle tree for that block that you care about and make sure that your coins have not been you know, double spent or whatever. So essentially what that means is client-side validation 
is now way cheaper because if you you know hold a hundred coins, you're checking a hundred branches in the in the Merkle tree, um, and this is kind of where you get this parallelization because the 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 um, from a client's perspective, you are you you have you know you can use your laptop to to validate the transactions, and then from a block proposer's perspective, it doesn't really matter. They can you know it, it can a block proposer can be an exchange, and they can have really beefy hardware. So you still get the 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 like you get the transaction throughput of a beefy exchange with the client side uh, validation and the security guarantees um, requiring only a laptop. Um, so this is like the this uh, uh, it's all about giving security to the users without limiting who can actually you know get that security and and you know keep it on a laptop anyway. So um, let's let's zoom out a little and do some role playing to sort of understand plasma. So the way I understand plasma is, let's say I don't know the, Brian and I are users on Ethereum and. We have Ether and we want to use this Ether to partake in some application, right? So the way um, this would work is if I want to, and there's a child, a plasma chain for that application, right? So when I want to take part in that application, I have to deposit my Ether into some smart contract on the Ethereum system. And I'm going to get some coins on this plasma chain. So if I deposit a hundred ether here, I might get a hundred coins and then I could take part in that application. And the same exists for Brian as a user. So you deposit, you get these coins and you partake in that application. Now under the hood, this plasma child chain is being validated or mined by a bunch of validators that are continuously creating blocks on the child chain. Now when I'm on the child chain, my instinct is, oh, I need to now trust that these group of validators are going to validate correctly and they're not going to commit invalid blocks on these child chain. Because if they can commit invalid blocks, then I could lose my 100 coins. And these 100 coins stand for 100 ether, so I stand to lose a lot of money. But what Plasma allows conceptually is for me to not need to trust these validators even though I'm on a chain and they're being validated by these, let's say these hundred parties. And ordinarily you might think that you would need to trust the collection of these hundred parties not to hit an invalid block. The way Plasma is structured is you remove that assumption of trust between me, the user and the validators. Even if they cheat, I can exit my hundred coins from the Plasma child chain and back into the Ethereum system, no matter how strongly they cheat. Would you say that is correct? Yes, that is absolutely correct. And this this is the kind of uh, the the beauty of that security is actually now w before you you probably had seventy validators so that you know you could uh, like get better security around uh, um, you know a decentralized consensus protocol like you get you get like stronger security properties and so that's why you had this more complicated uh, consensus protocol. However. Because you have this guarantee that even if you create an invalid block, there's no real problem for the plasma chain. You like a lot of plasma designs don't even need a really complicated and secure consensus protocol. They can actually just use a centralized service to do that for them, and that centralized service is actually limited in the kind of bad impact they can have. They can't actually steal anyone's coins. So you can take any exchange today and you can turn that exchange into a plasma chain. And now instead of having the problem where your exchange steals all your money, you now have this guarantee that your money will never be stolen. And you still get that high transaction throughput of the exchange. Thinking of, of this a little bit differently. Now, when I open Bitcoin market cap, right? So there's Bitcoin, there's Ethereum, and then there's 10,000 other coins, right? Now, today, uh, it might be the case that there might be some coin which is like, I don't know, 20 or 30 on coin market cap. Let's say, I don't know, Steam or uh, Zcash. And the, this individual coin might provide very interesting utility to me. But so when I own Ether and let's say I want to do private transactions, um, 
I might need to go to Zcash, which is number 27, or I might, if I want to do Steam like transactions, I could need to go to Steam, which is number 31. These are much smaller than Ethereum. So, um, when I switch from Ether to like to the Zcash system, what I'm what I'm really doing on the background is with when I was when I was holding Ether, I was in a chain that was more secure because the market cap is really large. The chances of it, uh, the blockchain being messed around with or attacked is quite low. But when I go from Ether to Zcash, I've suddenly increased my risk to a chain reversion in a big way because Zcash is a much smaller blockchain. So what a Plasma world looks like is a Zcash-like application could be a child chain. And then I'm in Ethereum, I deposited my Ether to a smart contract and I went to the Zcash-like child chain. I can do these private transactions. But I have the security of the second of, of, of Ether, which is second on the market cap. I don't need to dial down on my security as a, as a user, but yet I get access to the application and I, and that is also scalable. So in theory, what it might mean is, um, if this design succeeds, then a lot of the coin market cap, as we see, it might end up being rearranged because a lot of the smaller chains can now borrow security from this larger chain pretty trivially. Yeah, exactly. And this is this is the it is a like full design space of, you know, Plasma is not a particular product product or project. Plasma is a like design space which allows you to do exactly what you just said, um, which is super exciting. So that's why we have a bunch of people working on their own Plasma implementations, including uh, people from multiple different blockchain implementations like Cosmos and so, so this is interesting. So for me, a question that came up before was that, you know, you talked about how you have a plasma chain and then somebody will have to kind of report this and share some of this data and proofs about it on, on the main chain in the case of an attack. Does that mean it won't be possible to have a plasma chain that's kind of a zero knowledge chain, something like a Zcash type thing? So you can do zero knowledge proofs on you can you know check the validity of zero knowledge proofs on the main Ethereum. It is currently quite expensive, but this is where like the expanding the capabilities of the root chain is really critical. And so having something like sharding, where you now get higher transactions th transaction throughput and lower gas cost, um, you now will will be able to uh, you know support the not only the exits of any kind of chain architecture but also um the many many exits at the same time so the all of these like three kind of pieces fit together really nicely casper sharding and plasma this episode of epicenter is brought to you by gnosis gnosis is an open platform for businesses to create their own prediction markets on the ethereum network prediction markets are powerful tools for aggregating information about the expected outcome of future events. So this can be used for things like information gathering, incentivizing behaviors, making governance decisions, or even creating insurance products. So in order to turn Gnosis into the most powerful forecasting tool in the world, they recently launched Gnosis X. It's a challenge that invites developers to build applications on top of the platform. And the best applications per category will be rewarded up to $100,000 in GNO tokens. So throughout the year, Gnosis will announce different categories for the challenge. And the current challenge has categories for science and R&D, token diligence, and blockchain project integration. Gnosis also provides the SDK, which allows you to easily get started with everything you need to get coding. And they also provide dedicated support channels throughout the challenge for teams and solo builders. Are you up for the challenge? Get started now. To learn more and to sign up, go to epicenter.tv slash gnosisx. We'd like to thank Gnosis for their support of Epicenter. And now the other point where, where I wanted to, to come back to briefly, so we talked about validators before and how, you know, you can have you know, basically no reliance or no trust in, in those validators is required, or at least only a minimal one. And, you know, you brought up the point that you could even have a central operator. So is there any benefit to having, uh, you know, let's say 50 diverse parties validating such a plasma chain versus 
Coinbase or, you know, Mark Carpelli's or, you know, a particular party? Yeah, for sure. So, so the first, the first one is this like central operators, many central operators running plasma chains. Now, the, the other option is you take one of those central operators and first you add some validators. So you add a set, a group of you know, people who will essentially uh, uh, take the, the blocks from the central operator and they'll validate that you know, they're, they're the correct state transitions and that they're available. And then those validators will sign and that will be posted to the main chain. And now, now you still have, you, you now have better security because you have these validators, but you have a single uh, a block proposer. So now what you do is you say, okay, let's replace that single block proposer with anyone who wants to propose blocks for this plasma chain. And so now you can like rotate or randomly sample the block proposers and those block proposers submit blocks to the validators, the validators check them and it gets posted to the main chain. And so you now have this ability for like a much larger plasma chain that is not controlled by a single, you know, exchange, but that is a, a kind of a, a, a open decentralized platform that kind of more, more closely resembles what we see today. And so that is definitely a alternative vision. And that would mean there may be fewer plasma chains, but each plasma chain is much larger um, and uh, like its own ecosystem in some ways. Okay. So I, I didn't totally understand the benefit here of having having multiple validators is is so so what would what is the downside of having you know a particular operator just running the chains could they for example engage in censorship yes exactly so they can engage in censorship they can uh you know get shut down and they also if they do um submit an inval block it's basically arguable but you can you can say that essentially there's less security that uh, uh, you know protects the central operator from from uh, causing a mass exit. Although you can, you, what you can do is you can actually add security deposits to your central operator, so that if your central operator has uh, you know uh, does submit an invalid block, they lose a whole bunch of money. Right. So yeah, sure. The invalid block thing it sounds like you can protect against, right? But then the censorship thing that you probably can't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. I mean, you can always take your money from that plasma chain and put it on the root chain. And so that's no, there's no censorship there, but it can still be censored within that plasma chain, which is annoying. Yeah. So as long as like we have validators that are in different jurisdiction. So I think like we can say that there is like diminishing returns to the number of validators. Like if you have just one central operator adding a second, well, now, now you need to shut down two in order to shut down this plasma chain better. You can add in three, it still increases. But then once you have, I don't know, 30 or 40 and they're in different nations, maybe adding five more may not matter much. So, uh, but in order to have 30 or 40, you do need a consensus algorithm. And, you know, it starts looking like a traditional blockchain. So um, give us a sense of what these consensus algorithms powering plasma chains would be like. Um, does Casper work there? Does Tendermint work there? Or do we need to invent something new? So the actual consensus protocols can be super duper simple. You just have a, um, normally what you want to do is you want to actually shard validation. So the, the cool thing about Plasma Cache is that you can, you know, have really huge blocks. Um, but if you have really huge blocks, you're going to need to shard the actual validation of those blocks. So you take one big block, you split it into small subsections, and you randomly sample a you know committee of you know a certain number of validators to say, okay, I, you guys sign off on the availability and validity of this subsection of the block. And so if everyone signs off on the availability and validity of this block, then that block gets uh, contributed. Uh, you know, posted to the main chain. And so you can do this with like a BLS signature, similar to how Definity uh, uh, is structured. You can do this with a crypto economic um, uh, threshold signature. You can, there, there are a number of different ways, but essentially the, the overall like strategy is you take one big block, split it into small blocks. You take a big set of validators. You randomly sample those validators to validate the subsections of the block. Those validators sign off. If enough sign off, then it gets posted to the main chain. And we, you know, continue, uh, you know, as normal. So it's a it's a relatively simple um, consensus protocol, and you can add slashing pretty trivially. Um, and that slashing, uh, 
you know, you can slash validators for signing in off on invalid blocks. You can slash block proposers for creating invalid blocks. Um, and there, there are a number of things. And maybe something that I'll explain right now, which I actually meant to mention earlier, is so you have this like 20 minute finality uh, checkpointing mechanism, right? But that doesn't mean that you aren't able to provide economic guarantees around transaction inclusion even earlier than 20 minutes. So essentially what you can have is you can create slashing conditions for these block proposers that say, okay, if you're a block proposer and you sign this message saying, I will include this transaction in my next block, and you don't include that transaction in your next block, then you can get slashed. So essentially what you can get is you can send a transaction and get an instant confirmation where uh, either this transaction will be included or the block proposer will lose a million dollars or you know $10 million. And so you're actually able to get the, a kind of a gradient, different levels of economic finality um, uh, you know, at different periods of time. And this is, this is kind of uh, a, a, uh, the way in which we have this like slow finality, which is really, really, really secure. And then per application, or, or uh, you, you can kind of get a much more rapid finality. So you mentioned before the idea that the different plasma chains should be able to interoperate. How would that be possible? And would that be possible in the sense that like tokens can be used to be, move between chains or that you have like full smart contract calls or like applications that are built spanning multiple plasma chains? What's that going to look like? So this is definitely an open design space. One possibility is that in the plasma chain, you have a special transaction which says, okay, I'm going to move this coin from this chain to this other chain. And then in the other chain, an, a transaction is, is included at that same uh, uh, like ID that says, okay, now I have this coin on this chain and you, you know, transact there. So you don't actually have to touch the main chain. It's just like you assume that the transaction gets included here and then it, in, it gets included in the in the other chain and then the the interesting part is when you want to exit you basically have to prove you actually like you supply the the kind of path of chains that your coin went through and they just like quickly validate that all of those that that path is valid um so so this is a way to to support um not just like atomic swaps cross chain but actual like coins that kind of teleport to different um, plasma chains but there are multiple different um, like solutions for how to do this, and the actual design space of you know, for instance, smart contracts on plasma chains. That is something that is an open uh, research problem, and you know, please get involved. So um, the plasma white paper um, mentions that the fundamental challenge that must be solved to have a functioning plasma system is is the problem of data availability. Give us an idea what this what this really is. Uh, why is data availability a challenge? Data availability is the bane of blockchains. It's very it's the it's the hardest problem and it's really the it's the hardest problem that needs to be solved for plasma and it needs to be solved for sharding. It is terrifying. So here is the the um the the general kind of what data availability means is that if you have a data that is available, that means that anyone who is interested in that data is able to download it. So uh, available data is like data that is being gossiped on the gossip network. Um, and, and anyone is able to, to pull that in. Now, data availability is, is, is incredibly difficult, but in current blockchain uh, architectures using like proof of work, it's not actually a big problem. And the reason why is because essentially you, you fork away from, from chains that um, are unavailable. So if you cannot actually download a block, then you just don't use that, you know, you don't follow that chain. However, this gets tricky when you start using like uh, uh, when, you, when you have some concept of finality and in particular when you have these chains that are being built up on a a like on a root chain so if you have a, a smart contract where and, and in that smart contract you're posting headers block headers then if one of those block headers corresponds to an unavailable block there is no way to like fork around it unless you build in a forking mechanism in your smart contract so so either you like you have this forking which gets rid of your finality guarantees or you have finality which 
is a problem if the data is unavailable. And so the 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 core the core issue here is if you have a chain and in that chain one of the links is missing, the everything after that chain, I mean after that missing link is essentially useless. It doesn't actually do anything. And so in in very practical terms, the where this comes into play in plasma is let's say we have the simple Plasma architecture with a central operator. The central operator is committing block headers to the chain at a regular heartbeat. One of those times they commit a block, a block header for a block which they then subsequently delete. So they submit a block header, but then they delete the actual block contents. Now, from that moment on, there is no way for a user to validate whether or not their transaction was double spent, they have no information on what the actual state of the world is. And so they're forced to exit the chain. So you said delete, but you mean just they don't reveal it? Or like, what do you mean with delete? They either don't reveal it, they reveal it to, you know, the, their little coalition of, you know, sneaky people, or they just, or they even commit a block header which doesn't even correspond to any block at all. Maybe it's the zero hash. That one's pretty clear. It's pretty clear that your block, if it caches to zero, either you, you know, you know, broke the hashing function or your block doesn't exist. Or more pragmatically, so let's assume I build a central operator and I'm running it out of AWS. My data data center is in Silicon Valley. And hey, like, there's a big, massive power outage in the West Coast and my server j just doesn't work for the next two hours. But like prior to publishing the block, I had posted something on the Ethereum chain. My server went offline and now the block data, I, I, I cannot gossip it, gossip it to the world because it's down and I cannot actually access the machine because the power is down. So it could be malicious, right? Like I'm not revealing data because I'm malicious as a central operator, but it could also be I'm not revealing data because disaster struck me. Absolutely. What can happen in that scenario? So what would happen in that scenario is your users would say, okay, now I can't download this block. The operator is, you know, it's been a week and they still haven't given me the data that I need. I'm going to have to exit. So I'm going to send a transaction to the main Ethereum network and I'm going to pull my coins out of that plasma chain. And the plasma chain operator is going it, it, like assuming assuming no malicious activity that's just what will happen they'll they'll pull coins out of the the plasma chain now in the kind of bad case where the plasma operator actually does have the information does have the data but has you know maybe they've withheld it and w in with the withheld data they kind of committed a, a double spend and so there's actually invalid data but no one can prove the invalidity because they don't have access to that data now the operator, they can try to exit coins that they don't own because there's this like invalid spend. However, thankfully, do not fear, the actual rightful owner of that coin can say, okay, I'm going to challenge that exit and you know basically block it. And they, their, their challenge is paid for and they receive a kind of a, a, a bounty for, for doing that. So, so we're, while, so block withholding, not only is it a problem because you have to exit, but it's also a problem because it makes it so that you can't prove misbehave, like bad behavior very easily. And so these are like, it is just such a, such a tricky and annoying problem. Wait, so can you just reiterate that again? So let's say we have a block proposer, uh, they want to steal people's coins, right? So they, they publish a block header or the block hash on the main chain, they don't reveal this block. And then how do they try to exit coins that they don't actually own? So let's say they publish one block with an invalid state transition. Then they publish the next block with a valid state transition. So they say, okay, I'm going to invalidly say, I'm going to appropriate Carl's coins and I'm going to give them to Alice. And then the next, the next block Alice is going to send those coins to Bob. Now, if the plasma operator is actually Bob, and so the plasma operator submits an exit saying, don't you, you see, I want to exit these coins, and the last time they were spent, I own them because, you know, Alice sent them to me. But then the real, the real kind of annoying thing is that it turns out that Alice stole them from Carl. And so this, the, the, um, the, from the, point of view of the main chain, the main chain isn't able to kind of like detect that problem. However, 
there is someone who can. The person who can is the, the person who, anyone actually, who knows about the prior history of that coin and knows that there was no spend to Alice. And so they will challenge, they'll say, okay, you know, your block is unavailable. You know, you might have had an invalid block. You might have, you could have done anything. I'm going to challenge that because I know that you won't be able to provide a full history of, of valid spends. And so I'm going to provide the last valid spend of that coin. And then your job is to provide the next, you know, where I spent it. So you basically have to provide the, the point where Alice got the coins from Carl. And that, co that, that, that kind of link is actually a broken link. And so the challenge will, will succeed and the operator will, you know, be slashed and, you know, pay the person who challenged him. But Carl, doesn't this start to need like a panopticon, right? Like loads of people just watching like a hawk on whether the operators are cheating or not. Who, How do you incentivize this panopticon? So it's just the main chain, right? So the main chain has this dispute period. You submit transactions on the main chain. If you notice that one of those transactions is trying to withdraw a coin that you own, then you or anyone else just submit a, a, a challenge. And the cool thing is that these challenges are actually funded by the person who is trying to withdraw coins. So in other words, there's always, there is a bounty basically every time that you want to, that, that a, uh, you know, some, some invalid um, exit is, is submitted. So, you know, it kind of like is paid for by the person who's trying to exit. There's a different kind of problem here as well, which is, so the case is like this, right? Brian and uh, like Brian and Meher are users. Both of us put our money into the child chain, the plasma chain, and Carl's the operator, the malicious operator of the plasma chain. And he sort of allocated Brian's coins to Meher, did not publish that block. And then, um, and then in the next block, he spent, like Meher spent his coins, uh, but he, the card published that block and then like Meher is trying to withdraw the coins, the ex, Brian's coins essentially to the main chain is like, and Carl is allowing that behavior to happen, right? That, that's the, that's the essential nature of the problem. Now, um, wouldn't this problem become majorly worse if Carl is actually the biggest mining pool on the Ethereum network as well as the operator? Right now, if, if Carl is the biggest mining pool on the Ethereum network, if uh, let's say, so Brian is protesting in some way, he's trying to prove that like Carl's been malicious, he has not published this data and he's trying to play uh, play this uh, game essentially. But like if, Car if Carl is the biggest mining pool, then Carl could just censor Brian's efforts to prove that on the main Ethereum chain and that's game over for Brian. So yes, what you're talking about is like censoring the main chain so that these exits don't actually get included or the malicious exits get included with no challenge. So there is thankfully uh, some guarantees which proof of work provides, which are, you know, it is difficult, it is costly to censor a chain for the, you know, a period of three weeks and make sure that there is not a single miner that includes a, a uh, uh, or a single block that includes the transaction which challenges that, uh, uh, you know, withdrawal. And so basically what we rely on is we rely on the security properties of the root chain to provide security of the child chain. So the child chain might be censorship full and, and you know, it, it may commit an invalid block, but we have to make sure that our root chain is as, as resistant to censorship and as resistant to reversion as humanly possible. And so this, the, the, that is like the entire design space of, you know, these consensus protocols, Casper, proof of work. And this is like part of the, you know, the three um, kind of fronts of research. And we, we, and that's, basically what we're, what we're doing is making sure that it is very, very, very costly to the point where it's basically impossible to, you know, censor or revert the, the main chain in a, in a way that hurts the, the, the network. Yeah. I mean, I think in the scenario may have described, you would actually need to have a 51% attack, right? You need to have a majority of the hashing power. And then, you know, even if let's say you have 80%, Thrashing power, somebody else gets a block in, well, you're going to have to orphan that block. I mean, it would be a completely obvious full-scale attack on a network. So, yeah, of course, if that happens, all bets are off. 
Exactly. Or or a very popular ICO is going on in, on the main chain for two weeks, spamming the entire network completely. S- like the status ICO spammed the network for a day. So part of it is actually when you submit your your exit, you are going to fund the gas price of the challenge, right? So if 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 the if it's not a problem with you know censorship, like actual fifty one percent attack, the, and it's just a problem where you don't you know have enough money to to like challenge because your gas price is too low, um, you're actually okay in that circumstance because the 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 cost of the challenge, the cost of that ga- gas price is computed within the or is included in the 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 exit so like when you exit if gas price is you know a hundred uh gway then maybe there'll be a security factor of 10 or 100 so you have you now have this like extra bond which pays for the gas um so you'll 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 be fine even in a congested network um and you'd have to exit for each one of these coins so it just gets like impractical and we don't actually have this problem thankfully the coins are stuck. That is the problem. It's not that they can be stolen. They are just stuck. And that is annoying. But that's why we, we have, you know, more secure consensus protocols or, you know, slashing of central operators that misbehave. A, a separate related question, though, is let's say I'm a user and I'm on the child chain. I'm doing the transactions. Now, do I start to need a bot that's always going to watch what the operator of this child chain is doing and be prepared like and have an automated script that as soon as my bot perceives this data availability problem withdraw and uh, do this gas price management or is it the same like basically what I'm trying to ask is one of the criticisms of the lightning network is the lightning network pushes a lot of responsibility on the user who we are expecting to be a an average Joe that doesn't understand any of it right so on the Lightning Network, I, I always have to keep a full-on node that's like watching the Lightning transactions to make sure I got the money. That's fine for a power user, but that wouldn't work for an average Joe. Is Does Plasma have a similar problem where if I'm a normal user, I start to need these bots to keep watching on honesty of the operators? So someone does need to challenge uh, invalid transactions. Now, the actual like extent of this problem i would say is not so high at least in the case of plasma cash because number 1 a invalid transaction will essentially uh uh not be a problem until your particular coins are trying to be stolen right and when your coins are trying to are are you know there's an attempt to steal your particular coins there is a bounty that anyone can win for blocking that transaction, blocking that challenge. So the only thing that would keep someone else from blocking, you know, and uh, that that invalid exit and getting the bounty themselves is a, you know, is data availability. Basically, if if you are the only one who has information about your coin, then you're the only one who can challenge your coin. But in reality, there are going to be people who are probably going to store the information of other people's coins for probably not too much money, I would imagine. And then whenever there's an uh, invalid uh, exit or whenever there's an exit in general, they just check against their database. They say, is this valid or is this not valid? And if it's not valid, then they submit a challenge and you know make a whole bunch of money. So there is a kind of like inbuilt incentive for uh, uh, doing these invalid um challenges and you know you could even do a mechanism similar to how like Truebit was explaining where where you have like intentionally invalid exits so that people are incentivized to randomly store coins so you can like do fun things it's not a huge issue I don't see it as a huge issue and it should be uh, uh, you know it's part of the network uh, uh, kind of part name of the game in some ways for these state channels to have this challenge response thing so Let's talk a little bit about where we're at and, you know, what the timeline and roadmap is. So what are the main things that still need to be built for Plasma Cache to, you know, go live? And what are the biggest open questions or problems that need to be solved? Yeah, so first, Plasma Cache, Plasma, all of these designs are just a design. And anyone can implement them. 
and currently I am not personally implementing a huge amount of it. Actually, I, I uh, uh, and but there's a, there are a number of teams that are that are working on these things now. In terms of like research problems that need to be solved, there are definitely kind of open questions. So there's um, one of those open questions is doing uh, splits in plasma cash. So essentially, you have a particular coin and you want to make it, you want to subdivide it into a smaller kind of unit of transaction. Anyway, that's that's one kind of open question. There isn't a lot of consensus around the best way to do that. Um, another issue is there are actually ways to um, exit coins even if there's an invalid state transition in the history. You can actually like still use that coin. Um, now, this makes the exit process much more complicated, but if there was some kind of magical wand that we could use to kind of like uh, make the exit really simple while uh, including an invalid um, transaction, that would be awesome. So that's another open research question. Um, however, none of these things are kind of game showstoppers um, for anyone who does want to implement a Plasma Chain as it is right now. Um, we already get, you know, huge transaction throughput increase in the with these plasma chains and they're not that hard to implement um so i'm actually working on a course on crypto economics you know crypto economics dot study check it out um but <laughs> that course will will go through uh building a uh, uh you know centralized payment processor with like paypal then turn it into a bitcoin kind of uh, uh, a chain with its own consensus protocol and then add to its security by turning that into a plasma chain. And so throughout that actual course, like I am going to be implementing a plasma uh, uh, a plasma chain, and you know you can implement it too as as uh, you know as you know we follow along. And so so this is actually um, and this this course is not going to take you know years to create. It will be it's 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 coming. It's it's on on its way and being worked on actively um, you know in the next few months. And so this is. Plasma is coming soon and can be implemented today. There are no blockers, um, and so you should implement it. It's it's an exciting research area. Do you think there's a business model to to for a private company to implement plasma chains? Absolutely. I mean, any any kind of business model which you are, uh, you know, any any protocol, any uh, 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 application which like desires this higher level of security than a centralized service can provide. Anything like that can fit very nicely into a plasma chain, including uh, projects that are run by private operators. So so anyone who's doing a kind of like enterprise blockchain, for instance, um, might as well get the security of a uh, public decentralized blockchain by, you know, adding this plasma chain linking. Um, and and you don't really get too many downsides. It's actually not super hard to implement. Um, however, you and you get this like massive upside where you, the people who use your chain are now, you know, they can feel safe. They can say, okay, no matter what happens to this central operator, my assets are in fact safe. And so it kind of just changes the name of the game, changes the trust model, and provides good, you know, opportunities for for everybody. So I, I understand that point when it comes to, let's say you have a private chain that's some sort of exchange custody thing, right? And you take assets from, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, you know, that live on a blockchain or, or I guess Ethereum assets and you move them onto that chain and right? and then the plasma chain runs there and you can exit. But I mean, I guess mo many, or if not most enterprise or private blockchain use cases don't necessarily involve crypto assets or tokens. So then is there still any point to this linking? And and because what, what does exiting mean in that scenario? That is a fantastic question. So the actual like, what does exiting mean for your application can mean different things. So in Plasma Cash, it's very clear what exiting means. Exiting means taking your token and putting it onto the root chain. However, in a, you know, uh, a, a general like, a uh, a plasma chain that uses smart contracts, exiting might mean something different. It may mean uh, exiting some level, some amount of state and putting that onto the root chain. There may be other, you know, you, you may not have a lot of things that you want to exit necessarily, but you still want guarantees around uh, uh, ordering, like block ordering that, that can't be reverted. So like there's, there are, um, this is the, the kind of, unfortunately because the space is so young, 
there are there there's you know buzzwords that people throw around and they say okay this is you know a plasma chain this is a state channel this is a lightning network this is radiant whatever and then people assume that those 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 designs are like static and they exist in this kind of vacuum of possible you know applications that you can build when in fact there is an entire space you know crypto economics which uh, uh, has these fundamental building blocks which plasma was created out of which all these state channel solutions and even you know sharding and casper they are the fundamental building blocks are what you really need to understand to get the kind of decentralized security properties and decentralized guarantees that that we're looking for and so so like you can take a your you know you can take the kind of plasma design and you can alter it in some way that fits your application using this you know set of tools these crypto economic tools and then you know produce a you know private blockchain which provides the guarantees that you're you're looking for your for your specific application and and the, as the space matures the things that we're going to focus on are not the kind of buzzword um, design, you know, kind of spaces, but instead just a fundamental understanding of how these systems get built. And that's what I'm hoping that we can get to, you know, this year. You have mentioned a couple of times during this uh, recording that Plasma is relatively easy to implement. And I get a sense that Plasma is easy to implement because it is basically a set of smart contracts that are quite simple, right? They need to accept money and they need to accept block hashes and they need to implement this challenge response game, right? So that's a smart contract. And then once the, there's a plasma chain, there's validators on the chain and um, they can use a consensus mechanism and lo and behold, lots of different consensus mechanisms are being developed. There's Tendermint, there's like Definity, there's the Polkadot school and then there's Casper. So you could presumably really like borrow from a lot of work so it's basically like forking a consensus client and writing a smart contract and having a profitable application. So I'm curious what Ethereum Foundation's approach here is going to be. Is your approach going to be, hey, we guys are going to, we are the like thought leaders here. We let, we make the spec and let any commercial partner go and actually make the integration. Or is it going to be that the Ethereum Foundation will dedicate some person from the, the Go Ethereum team to actually implement the first working plasma chain so it will be the uh the first thing that you said so essentially we are are, are kind of thinking about these designs and coming up with architectures that make sense and design patterns this whole like space of crypto economics and then we publicize our results and the the uh then anyone in the community can pick up pick that stuff up and either contribute back to the research or they can implement it themselves. And so like Ethereum Foundation and Ethereum community is a very weird and decentralized, you know, uh, uh, kind of group of people. And that that basically just means there's some people who have good ideas. And that doesn't mean that they're even from the Ethereum Foundation. You know, jo Joseph Poon is not an official Ethereum Foundation researcher. And they come up with like good ideas, publish those good ideas. Anyone who wants to picks those things up and runs with it and everyone kind of like lives together and is in a big happy community That's all brought together by these crypto economic incentives So it's like this it's it's a it's this interesting process of basically idea propagation meme propagation And then people pick up on those ideas pick up on those memes implement it themselves and you know You can make all your money and do all your you know fancy, you know community building and and good stuff and and contribute back and and even the research process is open to anyone go on eth research and you know write up a plasma spec and c criticize our designs because they're not perfect so that's do as you will so so before we wrap up one important question that i'm sure is on the mind of many listeners so when is the ico happening and, and how can people reach out to you if they want to get in on the pre-sale <laughs> No ICO, clearly. This is a design. This is a space. ICOs are just one little thing you can do with this incredible consensus forming smart contract blockchain. So, you know, it, it'll be a lot of fun. We can, you know, not make a big deal about, oh, God, make our little landing pages with our flashy buzzwords, crypto economic security verification. Oh, God, geez. Let's calm down. Let's make the space and the world a better place. Okay, cool. Well, thanks so much um, for joining us today, Carl. This sounds super exciting. I mean, I think this is a really coherent and interesting 
vision for Ethereum. And I'm extremely excited to see when, what if this is actually going to, you know, get built and implemented and, and be usable. And it sounds like it's not far away. So thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. <laughs> and of course, we'll have links to a bunch of stuff like the Plasma Cash specification that uh, Carl published. Uh, or his crypto economics course and other things that people can check out if they want to learn more. So, um, yeah. So, we'll have that in the show notes and people can check that out. Yeah. So, thanks for once again tuning in. So, we're putting out new episodes of Epicenter every week. You can get the audio on iTunes, SoundCloud, or any other podcast application, or you can get the videos on youtube.com slash Epicenter Bitcoin. And we also have the Skitter community, which have uh, some little bit of activity. So you can check that out. That's at epicenter.tv slash Gitter. And otherwise, if you want to support the show, you can uh, leave us an iTunes review that helps new people find the show. And you can let us know what you like and what we can still do better. So thanks so much. And we look forward to being back next week. Bye.